Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 5. <clears throat> For the last several chapters in Chronicles, I have read the chapter and then shared what the Lord put on my heart. This is another one of those times where we're not going to focus so much on the verse by verse throughout the chapter. Most of the chapter um, deals with things that we've previously studied in other chapters, other books. Um, but the Lord showed me some things here, and I think it has great application to our life, and I believe that you'll be challenged by it. I know I was. So let's just read chapter 5, and then we'll go from there. It says, Thus all the work that Solomon made for the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in all the things that David his father had dedicated and the silver and the gold and all the instruments put he among the treasures of the house of God. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel unto Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. Wherefore, all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto the king in the feast of which was in the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the Levites took up the ark, and they brought up the ark and the tabernacle of the congregation and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle. These did the priests and the Levites bring up. Also King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him before the ark sacrificed sheep and oxen, which would not be told nor numbered for multitude. And the priest brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto, the, unto his place, to the oracle of the house, into the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubims. For the cherubims spread forth their wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubims covered the ark with the staves thereof above. And they drew out the staves of the ark, that the ends of the staves were seen from the ark before the oracle, but they were not seen without. And there, it, and there it is unto this day. There was nothing in the ark save the two tables which Moses put therein at Hebron, when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, for all the priests that were present were sanctified and did not then wait by course. Also the Levites, which were the singers, all of them of Asaph, of Heman, of Judithan, with their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar and with them and hundred and twenty priests sounding with trumpets. It came even to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord saying, for he is good and his mercy endureth forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Now, we've been studying for a long time, and the focus has been building God's house. And tonight, the title of the study the Lord's laid on my heart is this, Faithful to Finish the Work. Faithful to Finish the Work. 
And I want to go back, if you will, to the first chapter of 2 Chronicles. <clears throat> and I want to look at verse 1. And then we're going to make our way through a couple of these chapters back to chapter 5. <clears throat> Second Chronicles 1.1 1, 1 says this, And Solomon the son of David was strengthened in his kingdom, and the Lord his God was with him and magnified him exceedingly. I want to stop there to say it all begins with God. It all begins with God. When you first open the Bible and turn to the first chapter and the first book, you read, in the beginning, God. Beresheth Elohim. It all begins with Him. And we're told here in this verse that the Lord strengthened Solomon. The Lord gave him strength. Zechariah says, it's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. It all begins with God. After Moses died, God called Joshua even before that, and he commanded him to take the people into the promised land. One of the things he said in chapter 1, verse 9 is this. Be strong and of good courage. Be strong and of good courage. Joshua was called to fulfill a task for the Lord. There was a special calling on his life. There was a special task that God wanted him to fulfill. God wanted him to be faithful to finish the work. Solomon had a special task, so much so that David desired to do it, and God said, no, this is not for you. This is for Solomon. Tonight, you may not recognize it. You may not believe it. But God has a task for you. I will go so far as to say God has a bunch of tasks for you. We tend to think of one big thing like Solomon building the temple. And there may be something big like that in your life. But his plan for you might be just countless small things that when you step back and look at it all, it's really a big thing. Because it's required of stewards, it's required of those who are called by God to be faithful. And not just faithful, faithful to finish the work. I want to remind you of something. You can turn there if you want. I'm going to do a lot of flipping tonight. So if that makes you flip out, just stay in chapter 5. We'll be back before it's all said and done. But I'm going to cover a lot of ground. But in First Chronicles chapter 28... Verse 20. This is David speaking to Solomon. And David said to Solomon, his son, Be strong and of good courage and do it. Do it. I would stop there to ask you tonight, what is God saying for you to do? He said, be strong and of good courage and do it. Fear not, nor be dismayed, for the Lord God, even my God, will be with you. We read in the first verse, 2 Chronicles 1, that God was with him. It all begins with God. David said, the Lord God, even my God, will be with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee, notice, until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. God's going to be with you, Solomon. He's not going to forsake you. And He's going to be with you until the very 
end until the work is finished. Faithful to finish the work. There's nothing like a job done. Maybe you're like me. I'm task-oriented. I like getting things done. If tasks are an indication of when I'm going to die, I'm never going to die. Because I've got plans way out there. I've got all kinds of plans. I'm planning on top of plans on top of plans. Looking ahead as far as I can see on my tippy toes, straining with my eyes to see what's around the bend and how I can be prepared for it. There's nothing like finishing a task. And the opposite of that is true as well. There's nothing like a job undone. It's nagging. It's mocking. It's frustrating. It's disappointing for a job to be halfway done, three quarters done, or even worse, not even started yet. He says, Solomon, be strong and have good courage. Do it. He says, do it, son, because God is going to be with you and he's not going to forsake you. He's not going to fail you. Don't be dismayed. He's going to be with you until you finish the work that he's called you to do. There's something very comforting, something very motivating to me to think that God has a plan for my life. There's meaning for me to exist here on this planet and I can cooperate with him if I choose and God can use me. He can work in me. He can work through me and accomplish what he desires to do in my life. And I've said this before. I'll say it again. I do not want to live on this planet not one second, not one breath longer than finishing what he has for me. Because there's no reason to be here otherwise than to do and to finish what he's called me to do. And so he's speaking here to Solomon. And Psalm 127, one says this, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It all begins with God. It's gotta be with his strength. It's gotta be with his spirit. But we've gotta be strong. We've gotta be courageous. We've gotta do it. We've gotta trust that God's gonna see us through to the end. Look with me to chapter 2 of 2 Chronicles, verse 1. We see it all in the beginning. God is at work. He started that work in David. Through David, he encouraged Solomon. Now David is gone to be with the Lord, and Solomon is present before us. And in chapter 2, verse 1, it says this, And Solomon determined... If you write in your Bible, I would encourage you to circle, underline, make some type of notation. He determined. It all begins with the Lord. It begins with something within my heart. It begins with this calling. It begins with His plan. It begins with His purpose. But as that starts happening, there must be determination. There must be a cooperation in my heart and in my life. I don't know what God's called you to do. Oftentimes, people will come to me and say, well, I'm not really sure what my gifts and my talents are, and I've tried to talk with people, encourage people, and pray with people. I've had people say, well, God's called me to do X, Y, Z, I believe, and I'm terrified. There's no reason to be afraid. Where God guides, He provides. And God doesn't call the equipped, He equips the called. I've never been prepared to do what He's called me to do. But He was. It all begins with him, but there must be a determination. And we read here in verse 1 of chapter 2, Solomon determined to build an house for the Lord. Philippians 2.13 says this, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God gives those desires. There's nothing like waking up early in the morning, every morning, trying to fulfill those things that God has birthed within your heart. To me, that is the greatest experience I've ever experienced in my life, is to wake up, 
accomplishing those tasks, completing that next thing that God has in front of me. Oftentimes it's spontaneous. I don't even know about it until that morning. The other morning I woke up thinking about something that God wanted me to share in a video. So I took off my pajama shirt, put on another shirt, walked out to my truck, turned on my phone and recorded a message that God put on my heart about this past election. There's nothing like that. Being in tune with the Lord, following the Lord, listening to Him, and accomplishing those things. There's nothing like this idea of being faithful to finish the work. But there must be determination. And Solomon determined. It is God that works in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. If God has put some desire in your heart, He's going to put the desire and He's going to put the do there if you'll let Him. If there's desire there, I encourage you, pray. Pray, 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 and when you've done praying, keep praying. And as you pray, God will make the desire more clear and He'll give you more and more do to get her done. What we need to do when we're praying, though, is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, there's a lot of Christian people who are existing tonight. They're not living. They're just here. They're just occupying. They're just taking up space. And the clock is ticking. Tick, tock, tick, tock. And it makes its way around and around. And days pass. And weeks pass. And months pass. And they tell themselves, ah, one day, one day, if you've been saying one day for a lot of days, you need some determination. You need some willpower. And I don't say you need to somehow drum up that willpower. What I say to you is, is you need to submit to that desire that God has put there, to that calling that He's called you to, and say, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Luke's gospel, in Luke's account of the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prays, and He uses seven of the most powerful words that can ever come from a human heart. They are the most life-transforming words you will ever pray. Not my will, but thine be done. Seven words that'll transform your life. That's determination. That's waking up every day and saying, Father, I want your will to be done on earth, in my life, in my home, on my job, in my heart. Not my will, but thine be done. Solomon determined to build a house, and notice this, for the name of the Lord. It doesn't matter how much determination you have. You can be the most determined. You can have the most willpower. If you're doing it for your name, if you're doing it for someone else's name, maybe you're doing it for the boss's name. Maybe you're doing it for the preacher's name. Maybe you're doing it for the family name. If you're doing it for any other name other than the name of the Lord, You're doing it for all the wrong reasons. Because as the first verse we read, it all begins with the Lord. It begins with Him. It's for Him. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul says this, whatever your hands find to do. Ecclesiastes says basically the same thing. Whatever your hands find to do, do it all for the Lord. He says, do it with your whole heart. But before that, he says, whatever you do, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. If I woke up 
tomorrow morning, in Jesus' name, what would that look like? That's not what it would look like. If I woke up in the morning for the Lord, it wouldn't be, don't talk to me, I had had my first cup of coffee yet. I'm going to get in trouble tonight. <laughs> my mother used to say that to me all the time. Don't say anything to me, I haven't had my cup of coffee. And I'm like, what, what's that got to do with anything? <laughs> coffee doesn't make you talk. You talked last night before you went to bed, before you drunk the coffee. What would it look like if I woke up in Jesus' name? What would it look like if I poured that cup of coffee in Jesus' name? What would it look like if I looked at my phone to see if I missed any messages, any, any kind of news or whatever? What if I scrolled through Facebook in Jesus' name? What if I got ready in Jesus' name? What if I drove through traffic to wherever I was going in Jesus' name? What if I greeted everybody at the job site in Jesus' name? What if I did my job in Jesus' name? Solomon determined to build the house of, for the name of the Lord. It wasn't Solomon's house. It wasn't for his name. It wasn't for his father David's name. It wasn't for Israel's name. It wasn't for Jerusalem's name. We'd say, America. It wasn't for America. It's all for Jesus. What would happen in my life if it was all for Jesus? You take that type of determination, which is surrendered to God's call, God working within us, both the will and to do. We answer that call, we surrender to that call, and then with determination we say, your will be done, and I will do it, Lord, in your name. What would happen in my life? How would my life be transformed if I did everything I did? In Jesus' name. What if every conversation, every text, every post on social media, what if it was all for Jesus? Look at chapter 3, verse 1. God strengthened Solomon in 1-1. One, one. He strengthened him and he made him exceeding great. And 2-1, he determined to build a house for the name of the Lord. 3-1, get your pens ready if you're writing in your Bible. Then Solomon began to build. First he determined to build, and now he began to build the house of the Lord. He began to build the the house of the Lord. Jesus tells a parable in Matthew chapter 20 of a landowner calling people in the marketplace to work. And he walks up to this crowd of people and this is the question. Why stand ye here all day idle? Why is your motor running and you're not going anywhere? Solomon determined to build a house in the name of the Lord. There's a lot of believers who de are determined to do stuff. There's been times in my life I was determined, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start that. I I'm going to memorize that verse. I'm, I'm going to get going with this quiet time. I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to participate in that activity. I'm going to start serving in that way at my church. I I'm going to start tithing. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. There's a lot of determination, and that's good, and that's part of the process. But at some point, you got to get started. That landowner says, why stand you all, all day idle? They said, well, no man has hired us. Can I say to you tonight, if you're born again, if you're saved, you've been hired. You've been hired. You're on the payroll. You've been called. You have a purpose. And the Lord is looking for you. He's looking for me to be faithful to finish the work. But we're never, ever, ever going to be able to finish the work if, number one, He hasn't called us to it. Number two, we don't determine to do it. And number three, we don't 
start. Why stand ye here all the day idle? I wonder tonight, what areas of my life is my motor running, but I'm not in gear? You could ask yourself that same question. Is there any area of your life that God's called you to do something? Forgive someone? Start praying for someone? Change something? Give up a habit? Whatever it might be. And you've talked about it. You know you should do it. Other people have told you you should do it. You get frustrated when they remind you. And you're determined one day it's going to happen. Solomon began. He began. In the book of Acts, chapter 1, Jesus is taken up before the eyes of the disciples and he's received up into the clouds and two angels stood there shining bright in white apparel and this is what they said why stand ye here gazing up into heaven some believers would say you know what yes God's called me yes I'm determined but I haven't begun yet because I'm still seeking the Lord I'm gazing up into heaven there comes a point, there comes a time when you've got to stop gazing and start going. Now, only God can tell you that in your life. I can't. I'm not the one to tell you that. Maybe, maybe you should be gazing right now. But if you're supposed to be going, God's asking the question, why stand you here gazing? They go on to say, Why stand you here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which you have seen taken up into heaven shall so Return in like manner. You need to go and tarry like he told you. The angels are saying, come on, guys. He told you this was going to happen. Get with it. Get with the program. He's given you instructions. He's already told you what to do. Some believers are sitting in pews and they're saying, well, God hasn't specifically told me to do anything. He's told you a lot of things. He's told you a lot of things. He's told me a lot of things. And I don't have to hear a still small voice. I don't have to hear an audible voice. It doesn't have to be, Gordon, you're going to Uganda. Sell all of your stuff. Buy you a good pair of boots and get you a backpack. Start taking all of your shots. I don't have to hear that. He's told me, pray without ceasing. Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Continue in my word. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Pray one for another. Love one another. Encourage one another. Forgive one another. Love your wife. Train up your children the way that they should go. And the list goes on and on and on and on and on and on. He's already told me. And he would say to me, Gordon, why are you standing around, son? Why, why is your motor in idle? In neutral or maybe maybe you're not standing around waiting to do something maybe you're not standing there gazing up into heaven maybe you're like Peter was in John chapter 21 maybe you're too worried and wrapped up in what somebody else is doing or not to be doing what it is that God's called you to do Peter do you love me Lord, I like you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? I, I, I like you, Lord. I like you. Feed my lambs. Peter, do you like me? Lord, you know all things. You know I like you. Feed my sheep. Well, Lord, what about that guy over there? Peter? If I want him to stand right here until I come back, what is that to you? You follow me. Now, because I'm task-oriented, I don't so much struggle with the, why do you stand around here idle? I struggle with the idle part. Sometimes we need to be idle. Come apart and rest a while or you might come apart. I have to be reminded of that. Now, I've been guilty of gazing up into heaven. I love to worship and I love to seek God's presence. But I think the one of these three things that I'm the most guilty of is this one. What is that to you, Gordon? Go 
the mood, son. Inside joke for some of these young people. What is that to you? How many times, like Martha, have I gotten bent out of shape, worried about what someone else is doing or not doing? And you know what the truth is? When I'm worried about you, I'm not taking care of me. And I'm not going to give an account for you. I'm going to give an account for me. Maybe you're not standing around idle. Maybe you're not standing around gazing. Maybe you're not standing around looking at other people and judging them by what they are or are not doing. Maybe you're faced like Nehemiah. You're in the middle of the work, but the enemy... The enemy just keeps coming. He just keeps coming at you and he tries all different ways and he's doing his best to get you to come off the wall. I hope you're like Nehemiah and you say, this is a great work. I don't have time for that. I hope you're in a habit of telling the enemy. And a lot of times the enemy uses people. People aren't the enemy, but he loves to use people. You got to get used to saying, this is a great work. I don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. There's so many distractions in the world. And Christians, they get distracted too. Just like the rest of the world. And if we're not careful, we find ourselves doing all kinds of things except what the Lord calls us to do. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah, where the Lord appeared unto David his father in the place that David had prepared and the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. He began the work, but he didn't just begin it, he began it at the right place. If God has called you to do something, he's called you to a specific place to do it. It all begins with him, and we must begin the work. Now turn back to chapter 5. So if you stayed there, you're, you're ahead of the game. But not for long, because we're going to take off again. Chapter 5, verse 1. 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 5, 1. Thus all the work that Solomon made for the house of the Lord was finished. I love that word, finished. There's something deeply satisfying to me when I hear that word, finished. A lot of people are into the beginning. They like starting stuff. Now, I must confess, I've been guilty of starting a lot of stuff. We're only about two months away from a whole bunch of starts. People are going to start all kinds of things. Some will last longer than others. But it's the finishers. Those are the ones who are rewarded. And he finished. He finished the work. You know Ecclesiastes 7, 8 says, the end of a thing is better than the beginning. We love fresh starts, new starts, redos, New beginnings. We get excited about those things. We love those things. Ideas and plans and dreams and vacations and all of this kind of stuff. And none of that's bad. Solomon began the work. But finishing, that's where it's at. That's where the real satisfaction comes. Now notice, not only... Does it say that he finished? It says, And Solomon brought in all the things that David his father had dedicated. It takes dedication, not just determination. And that dedication must be the Lord's. All those things that were dedicated to him. Romans 12 tells us that we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice. We are to be totally and completely dedicated to the Lord. Notice what he says. The silver, the gold, and all the instruments... He put he among the treasures of the house of the Lord. Treasures. You know, Jesus says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. 
And Proverbs 4 says, guard your heart, for out of it flow all the issues of life. Just like that muscle pumps within my chest, and circulates blood throughout my body, carrying life. Spiritually speaking, my heart, my heart is about pumping all those issues. We, gotta, we have to guard that. We have to be careful about that if we're going to finish. Now I'm about to jump through a lot of scriptures. So those of you who are brave, let's turn to Acts chapter 13. Faithful to finish the work. I'm going to look at a couple of examples of finishers and how this applies to us. In Acts chapter 13, Paul is preaching. And in verse 25, he says this, speaking of John the Baptist. And as John fulfilled his course. John fulfilled his his course. He said, Whom think ye that I am? I am not he. But behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to lose. When John finished his course, he finished. And John the Baptist's job was to point Jesus out that was it. Think about that. His finish was Jesus' beginning. On earth, that is. He says, he's the one. And God says, okay, you finished your work. Time for prison. Time for your head on a charger. That was his job. That was his calling. That was his task. And we read through that and go, oh, poor John. Imagine that. Spending his whole life being faithful, living out there in the middle of nowhere. Long hair. Leather jacket. Levi belt. Eating bugs and honey. People thinking he's crazy. Baptizing people. Finally gets to the pinnacle of his entire life. It says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And God says, You finished your course. You finished your course. Paul says he finished his course. Turn with me, same book, chapter 20. Paul is talking to the Ephesian elders. He's about to go to Jerusalem the Holy Spirit's saying that he's going to face trouble and problems, persecution. The elders are concerned for him. They're trying to talk him out of going. They're trying to discourage him. And this is what he says, verse 24. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my, my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course and not just finish my course. He says, finish my course with joy. Oh, when the saints come dragging in. Oh, when the saints come dragging in. No. Saints are never supposed to be dragging. They're to be finishing their course with joy. Finishing their course with joy, he says. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He says, I want to finish my course with joy. I want to, I want to fulfill my ministry. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, you can turn there. Paul gives a description. He paints a picture with words to help us kind of get this idea. 1 Corinthians 9, 24, he says this, Now you know that they which run a race run all. There's a lot of people in the race. 
He says, but one receiveth the prize. Just because they gave you a number and you got you some cool looking running shoes and your little shirt and running shorts match. Paul says, that's not what it's all about. He says, well, at least not for me, he says. It's not for me that way. Now, maybe some people say, well, you know, I was in a marathon. Did you win? Oh, I was never going to win. Now, there's nothing wrong with being in a marathon and not winning because you're way ahead of me because I'm never going to finish a marathon unless they drive me in the back of that ambulance to the rest of the way. But Paul says, why be in it if you're not going to win? Paul had something on the inside of him. We're going to discuss what that is in a moment. Paul wanted to win. He said, everybody runs in the race, but only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain. He says, if you're going to be in the race, win the race. Don't just barely finish. Be the first to finish. Be the one that breaks the tape and you hear all that all those pictures taken and all the Gatorades being handed to you you fall down and make this big scene in front of all the press he says and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown but we an incorruptible he says don't forget don't lose sight of the eternal he says I therefore so run not as uncertainly I'm not just running to be running. I'm not just out there for the fun of it. He says, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. He said, I'm not a shadow boxer. I'm in it to win it. He says, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Another familiar passage of Scripture in Philippians chapter 3. Just a few books farther. Philippians 3, 13 and 14, very familiar to all of us. He says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The prize, the finish line. What is that prize? In 1 John 3, John says, Beloved, it's not really clear what we're going to be, but this is what we know. When Christ appears, when we see Him, we're going to be made like Him. The finish line. Paul says, I keep, I, I'm, not, I'm not looking back. Where, where, where's Brother John at? Is he getting close? Is he gaining on me? What's that to you? Come on. Follow me. Run to win. Focus on the prize. Faithful to finish the work. Last verse on Paul is 2 Timothy chapter 4. Starting at verse 6, Paul says this, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Paul says, I finished. He said, this is my ambition. I want to finish the work. I run to win. That's all I think about. I forget what's behind. I'm pressing. I'm reaching. And then he says here, I finished. Now you say, well, Gordon, that's Paul. I'm not Paul. Who said you had to be? The thing that made Paul special is the same thing that makes every Christian special. There's no ingredient in him that is not in us. Same Lord. Same spirit. That's where he got it from. Jesus is a finisher. Our God is a finisher. 
John chapter 4. Verse 34, Jesus is talking to the woman at the well. The guys go into town to get some food. They come back. I don't know, maybe they went to Jason's, Panda. Maybe they didn't have a lot of money. They went to McDonald's, got a couple of Happy Meals. I'm joking. They come back. They offer Jesus something to eat. And he says this. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. But he doesn't stop there. He doesn't just say, my will, my purpose is to do the will of him that sent me. He says, and to finish, and to finish his work. To finish it. I don't know what God's called you to do. Maybe God's called you to do the laundry. Finish it. Maybe God's called you to wash the dishes. Finish it. Maybe he's called you to study for a test or a quiz or exam. Finish it. Maybe you started a Bible study last year. <laughs> Finish it. Maybe you made a commitment to read all the way through the Bible. Finish it. I don't know what he's called you to do. I don't know what task he's given to you. Some of them take less time than others, but finish it. Jesus says, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Chapter 5 of John, verse 36. Jesus says this, But I have greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish. Notice that. The Father didn't just give me work to do. The Father's not just interested in me being busy. He's interested in me finishing. Finishing the work. He says, the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. Same book, chapter 17, verse 4. Jesus is praying to the Father. It's really the Lord's Prayer. We call the Lord's Prayer the Lord's Prayer, but the Lord's Prayer is really a model for us to pray. John chapter 17 is the real Lord's Prayer. That's the Lord praying and in verse 4, this is what he says. I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. I find this interesting. Talk about determination. Talk about determination. Jesus is saying, it's done, Father. I wonder tonight if that could be said of me. All the things that God has called me to do, we can already just say, count it done. He says, the work that you've given me to do, I finished that work. And in John 19, 30, Jesus on the cross, says, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. It is finished. It is finished. Two more, chap two more verses, not chapters. Philippians chapter 1. <laughs> knowing that Jesus is a finisher, and knowing that Jesus dwells on the inside of us, knowing that He has called us to specific tasks, works, we have to come to the conclusion that He wants us to finish too. And this is what Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Being confident. Confident. I hope tonight you are confident in this. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun, begun a good work in you, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That good thing that he started in you, those works that he's given you, and he has given us works to do, all of us, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, we know that. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's not of works, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. He goes on to say, we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath prepared for us to walk in. 
He that begun that good work, he'll complete it. Last verse before we get back to chapter 5 and wrap this all up. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing also we are compassed with a great, so great a cloud of witnesses, those who have gone before, those who have finished their course, like Paul, like Solomon, like John the Baptist. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Run your race. Run to win. Cast off anything and everything that slows you down, hinders you, turn you to the side. How do I do this? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher. He's a finisher, which means I am to be a finisher. The author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now when we started this, we said it all begins with God. What begins with God ends in glory. What begins with God ends with glory. Last verse, Second Chronicles chapter 5. Last verse I'm going to have you turn to. It probably won't be the last verse that we deal with. But notice the last part of, chapter, of verse 14 of chapter 5. The glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. The glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. What starts with God finishes with glory. In Psalm 73, I believe it's verse 24, the psalmist says, you will guide me with your counsels and receive me to glory. Paul says, whether you eat or whether you drink, Oof. That's a tough one, huh? If we did everything in Jesus' name, if we ate in Jesus' name, whether you eat or whether you drink, or whatsoever you do, he says, do all to the glory of God. In another place, he says, you've been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. 2 Corinthians 3.18, But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. What begins with God ends with glory. There's something glorious about finishing the work. So I want to encourage you tonight. I don't know what God's called you to. I know that He's called you to a lot of things. We typically think about calling as the big stuff. You know, I'm going to be a Sunday school teacher, an evangelist, a missionary, or whatever. Even those big things are really accumulation of little things. I'm going to raise my children. I'm going to homeschool my kids. Whatever it might be. That's a big thing. But it's really an accumulation of a bunch of little things. And if you want that to end in glory... It's got to start with God, His strength, His presence and power. You've got to determine to do it. Stop waffling. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. You've got to begin, and you need to finish. Finish it. Well, Gordon, you know, I kind of got distracted, and it's been a long time. So, that's an excuse. Get back at it. Finish it. I'm not so sure I can. He can. Because he's a finisher. And he desires to finish things in us. Amen? Let's be faithful to finish the work. Let's pray. Lord.